Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Political Vigilante. We are here uh, with Mitchell Health again. Mitchell, how are you? Oh, uh, nice to be here. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, so, folks, this is one of the things you get to do at the $25 la uh, l uh, level at the Patreon. You get to do this is now Zoom. We're using Zoom, which is way more encrypted than Skype. Um, so the NSA can only watch part of it. Um, and uh, <laughs> what you want to talk about today, you sent me an article um, that, uh, that, again, from weather.com, that the Earth is on pace for the fourth warmest year on record. And this is according to NOAA and NASA. So you want to enlighten us exactly what is happening? Yes, this is not my data. Uh, this is NOAA, the National or or Oceanic and, and uh, Association. So this is the official uh, government data, which in an administration that does not want to admit climate change is going way out on the limb again, uh, letting us see what's out there. Of the last 405 months, all have been above normal. Wow. That's months. <laughs> so uh, again, we set another record this month because each month we keep going one more. I... I used to be a consultant for a company that uh, originated a process called statistical process control. And uh, uh, so in the factories, to get the extreme quality of Japanese factories and now uh, factories worldwide, uh, they would plot how things were doing. And if there was a line in three instances above the, uh, on the same side of the line, meant either something was getting better or getting worse, mm -hmm. and then an engineer would be sent out to see why you why you went three times right. so um again we have 405 months that we have not crossed the line back below average that tells me yes <laughs> three would have been enough to send an engineer right 405 is something incredible so uh i i just love the fact that they reported th that amount of data uh, then I'm going to uh, do a screen share. Okay. Uh, and you should be seeing uh, a data snapshot from climate.gov uh, website okay. from NOAA. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the drought monitor. And since, since last time we did mention a bit of the overlap between the drought and uh, the inundation. Uh, from uh, global warming, uh, we're looking at uh, our, our recent news has been ENSA, that is the El Nino uh, uh, north-south uh, oscillation of warm water okay. off the west coast of the U.S. all the way down to uh, Colombia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th because of the way the, the water is behaving, we're looking at another extreme drought uh, for uh, California, uh, and especially Oregon. And um, continued... Uh, is it, is it, I'm looking correct. This is this map down here. This is the drought monitor that you're talking about? Yes, okay. yes. And as, as you go into these, uh, one, it's to me, it's almost most notable that North uh, Montana is getting hit so heavy. Uh, or I guess that's North Dakota and Montana, mm -hmm. uh, okay. because that's where the water originates for the Missouri River. Oh, wow. And then you've got severe drought in here. This is New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado are facing severe drought. This is uh -oh. California. Yeah, it's going to be severe, although they are going to see some rain, <laughs> because the El Nino tends to bring a little bit more moisture to the area, but it's, they have just such a deficit that there's not, uh, you know, uh, biblical floods wouldn't help them. <laughs> right. uh, so I, I don't mean to laugh at them. But uh, the uh, uh, national parks in that area, like in uh, or around Utah, are getting hit heavy. Right. And uh, so that's going to affect air quality, not only around here, but air quality out west as, as you start getting for, forest fires all triggering. Wow. and. When, when are they predicting that this is that this is going to start happening? The next this thing? will be within weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so it has already started shifting, and that's uh, where they released that um, 
we're going to have an exceptionally warm winter for the west half of the United States. Mm. And a warm winter means not a lot of snow. And not a lot of snow means not a lot of water next year for California. Yeah, so, so people who don't know the way the, the way it works out west basically is, um, so we have a very desert climate here in California, so it does not rain. We had our first rainstorm in probably four or five months, but then the winter months typically rain a lot. And then it creates a lot of snow in the higher elevations. That snowpack uh, stays up there all winter, and then it melts off in the spring, and that what is fuels, that's what fills up so much of our uh, of our water supply. So without that, that was what happened, you know, a couple of years ago it was 2015. We were coming off of five years of drought and it was, it was very, very severe. And that's what also fuels all of these massive forest fires because there's so much drought. You basically just have mountains and mountains of fuel to burn, um, which again affects air quality as you've talked about and other things. So what else can we see from this information that they've put out? Well, uh, if I facetiously characterize California drinking water, mm -hmm. it's melted snow and Colorado sewage. Right. Uh, so your water quality is going to go really bad this year. Uh, uh, and uh, I, again, I just see it as very bad for out west. I don't really know the extent of it. I, again, I'd like to applaud NOAA for allowing us to see this. Yeah, uh, they could easily cover this up. I mean, this is pretty significant. And I mean, this and is kind of important. you won't believe who we have to thank for this. Oh. Richard Nixon. Oh, really, Richard Nixon? Well, you know, that was the thing about Nixon. There's a lot much. There's much to be critical of Nixon uh, for very good reason. Uh, he also created the EPA. Yes, this, this was recreate, created with the same stroke as the EPA, uh, and it was to allow businesses and the public to have access to, to data like this. So they are doing their charter to the letter when, when they present this data to us, even though uh, major news outlets aren't, won't even really get into it. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, uh, again, I thought I'd keep it short. I'm also really concerned about Missouri again. Explain uh, to us why you, where, where is your concern for Missouri coming from? What, what, we're showing this abnormally dry Missouri. Right in here. Yeah. Uh, and Missouri uh, is, is an issue of it's extremely vulnerable to hail because of the type of crops they grow. They grow a mixture of the crops of Iowa and Kansas is a way to, way to look at it. So their crops can be easily damaged by hail. So when they get a storm, it's going to be bad, going to be hit heavy of stuff that's already weakened by not enough water. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that not enough water. Missouri has a place called the Ozarks. Their tourism mm -hmm. is based on water. And uh, if, if um, it's not a good season for, the, for boats getting out, they're not going to have a, a, a good time. Uh, but food-wise, this means expensive food. Uh, you know, it's a state the size of Illinois that has a lot of agriculture. People don't realize that Missouri has agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're getting this hit at the same time where we have all this abnormal warmth, brings a lot of moisture up from the Gulf, but it doesn't go straight up directly to Missouri. Uh, it meets what's called this dry line, where the arid uh, winds from the west meet meet the uh, humid uh, air coming up from the Gulf, and it kind of goes about forty five degree angle from from uh, Texas, and uh, it puts Missouri right at that boundary. So we could possibly even see a, so when they when they do have a storm, it's going to be very bad because tornadoes like to form at that line. And that, that line used to form in Oklahoma and Texas. Mm. Uh, so you're predicting, or what they're predicting, is severe drought, which is going to affect their agricultural business and their tourism. And then it's also going to lift the line of severe tornadoes? Yeah. Uh, th th another recent event happening is they've released that... Um, the tornado center for the United States is moving more toward Memphis. 
Wow. You know, people used to think of Kansas as, as the tornado center because of where that dry line was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a lot of people live in that area. And, and I, I, it's a nice area. Uh, it does, it's not as cold as uh, the northern tier of American states. And it's not as hot as, as Florida. I said, Florida is hot. I don't care when you go there. <laughs> and uh, so it, to me, t Tennessee really has a nice temperature, smooth rolling hills for, for a lot of it. Get to the east and it's in incredibly scenic. But at the western uh, Tennessee, uh, you know, it's such a perfect area to, to build. And I, I see it, uh, these sun thunderstorms. We might have to rethink our design of buildings in, in, the, in the, that region if we're going to start seeing uh, the tornadoes that we used to see in the, in the states west of them because they, don't, uh, they have more moisture. And that means they have more energy than the storms that we used to get. And we used to get really bad ones. So what other information that you've seen here uh, from NOAA and NASA that is uh, concerning to you? That's about it. Uh, I, I thought that, again, this alone was noteworthy. Um, so let me ask you this. What, when you come across this data, that again, the government is putting out there, this is not your data, what do you think should be done about it? We need to, we need to start having a better dialogue about how we act as a, uh, as a country and how we're going to deal with it. We're, we're at the flat part of the hockey stick. We're not at the point where it's really going up fast. Uh, still, and if we don't start thinking about the issues and dealing with them now, we are not going to be ready for dealing with it. When people start giving up the ghost and saying, I can't live out here, you know, people, a lot of people have moved to Oregon and haven't been there that long. And it, still, they moved there because it was beautiful and green. What are they going to do when there's no more water? You know, they're going to have to move and they're going to take a huge financial hit for it because land and housing is not cheap in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So as people, if people start flooding into, uh, let's say that confluence of states where Missouri, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas all come together, mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, it's a place that's going to have a lot of water. It's got good altitude. Uh, that land value is going to shoot through the roof. How are people going to afford to move here? We have people now that are in poverty. How are they going to be able to move to an area they can live? And we're talking about 12 years from now. Right. How, so how do you see the, you know, when the, if the droughts just keep increasing in the West, do you see that creating a lot of, uh, climate refugees? Yes, yes, especially. Uh, is the, I, I've even seen one article this week from one, one reporter who said she's leaving Oregon. Really? Yes, I should find that article, pull it up. But uh, that the, the smoke from the fires, that they, they moved to Oregon to get away from the problems they were having in California with the water. And once you get near... Uh, Washington, you have this old uh, lava flow that really doesn't give you access to uh, the ground. It's it's very thick. Uh, so uh, every state is different, and the uh, the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians form uh, a weather weather pattern because of how they f make uh, airflow from from Canada down through the United States, and it's a uh, um, it's something that's really not duplicated in the other continents because usually the mountain ranges don't go in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is going to leave the area in that funnel as the only places with water in basically the east sides of that. So what, uh, 
we probably can handle it water-wise, taking on the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. But economic-wise, how are we going to handle it? Our, uh, we, you know, we still have a thing with refugees from other countries. We don't want anybody to get in and share what we view as the small amount that we have. So what's going to happen uh, as the states uh, uh, that are losing land uh, and their, their people move, are people going to start demanding that they be given pieces of the land in the other states? Yeah, that is a, a huge uh, political and social uh, quagmire. What are you what are you going to do? And, and since so much of tax revenue is based on how many people live there, um, <laughs> so much is based on census data. And if it all shifts, what's going to happen? Um, and then it's not only is it shifting, but then these states are in uh, complete water shortages, which, you know, California and Oregon and Washington have a lot of agriculture. <laughs> I mean, those states on the West Coast have a, provide a lot of agriculture. How is it going to affect that economically? And as you say, the price of food is going to go up for the whole country. And then if it's also affecting Missouri and other parts of it, I mean, this is, this is everyone's just going to be living here. We're going to have 300 million people all just living right here. Yeah. Well, Arizona also, uh, and some parts of um, New Mexico do have what's called a, a winter food basket. Uh, and so they're not completely without being hit. And they're severe now. <laughs> uh, um, chili peppers are from, from up here tend to come from, uh, I believe, Arizona. Mm -hmm. We call them Santa Fe peppers. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, you know, just the slightest things that, that people might not realize that, you know, Midwest is not the only food basket. Mm -hmm. And the food baskets we have for the winter times are the ones that are most at risk right now, uh, especially Florida is not really having much of a drought. Uh, it does have some areas that are indicated, but uh, they're having, they're going to have population squeeze in the agricultural areas in Florida. A, a lot of corn in the United States that uh, from the winter comes from Florida. Do you, how long, do, according to this website, how long do you think the, um, the drought will last? I don't see it. You might have occasional bursts, but this is probably our new normal. And since we're on 405 months of continually worsening climate, why would 406 be any better? Right. Or how much better would it be if we even take back two or three months? Um, we, we still are in, in a bad range. And if we think about it, you know, if we think of every person as having a straw into the water supplies of, of California and New Mexico and uh, Arizona and Nevada, um, it could rain tomorrow. We still have all these millions of people sifting on their straws. Them, them and just a couple of Nabiscos and you've got the rest, right? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. So what I'd, I'd like to see more of is in you know, 2015, Governor Jerry Brown of California instituted all these water saving measures and he cut back the state's water usage by about 20%. And I think uh, the Western states need to, imp just laws across the board of like waterless urinals, um, uh, and they were doing this big program in California, at least in parts of LA, um, LA Department of Water and Power was doing, they were giving everybody uh, rain barrels that you would hook up to your gutter uh, and they had little spigots at the end so you could use it to, to, to water your lawn. I think everyone, you know, I was in, you know, when we did the progressive comedy tour in May, we were in Lake Havasu in Arizona and nobody has a grass lawn in Arizona. It's all rocks and cactus and stuff like that. Maybe they'll have fake grass. And I was like, that's what it needs to happen in, in, in California. I mean, that like people with a nice green grass lawn, I would get rid of it right now because it's, it's only going to cost you more. I'd put rain barrels on every uh, drain pipe you have. Hey, look at that. We have another interview here. What do we... <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is Victor. 
What's up, Victor? Uh, he uh, had to have his hair shaved off because of the you know, he had some fleas, and uh, his coat is very thick. So even giving flea medicine and and everything it doesn't help. So we had to have to get his hair short enough to work with a comb. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, it got me off track there. No, but uh, I, uh, like there's it. no reason that that water can't be trained into California. Uh, Nestle could just as easily uh, take water from Lake Michigan, put it on a train, and 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 take it to uh, California. I mean, that's one solution. But there's so many things here, like just in Los Angeles. So when it rains, they built I don't know 80, 100 years ago, just these you know concrete rivers and when it rains it just all the water just goes out into the ocean they've started to build uh, in santa monica near the santa monica pier they built what they call a smurf facility facility which is the santa monica urban runoff facility where they capture rainwater recycle it and put it back in and i think that like everywhere uh, in any city that does that along a coast, they need to capture the rainwater. We're not capturing enough and reusing the rainwater. We're not, you know, like water reclamation should be like a top priority. Water reduction should be a top priority. And uh, that just needs to be laws. Those, those laws just need to be passed today. Yeah, well, it's a complicated thing because just cutting down on the water isn't enough. Uh, take, for instance, the, the urinal without the water. What, what happens then is you're gonna get this concentrated dumping into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Now, theoretically to keep a river as it is, and our data hasn't been updated for a long time. A lot of times uh, civil engineers uh, will be using the same data that's been collected since the 50s, 40s, or 20s. Mm -hmm. When, uh, let's say, you know, the, the rules for a PVC pipe or to meant for a certain amount of water flow. The, the, the sewage discharge into the river, the amount you're allowed to do, well, if that's calculated for a population of 200,000, like for Des Moines, the same rules don't apply for Los Angeles. So if one person puts uh, uh, um, a quart of urine into, into the, the river, and that, that's almost going to really closely go to the ocean. You need to balance the uh, contents, salt-wise and elect electrolyte-wise, with what's going to be in the ocean. In order to do that, you need nine more quarts of clean water. <laughs> so we have this thing of we just have so many people in the Los Angeles base that we almost need to say, Ecologically, you're beyond your carrying point in, in Los Angeles for this drought period. And we need to somehow uh, entice people to move away from Los Angeles. And, and I realize our weather is horrible and, and it just could kill people from Los, Los Angeles. But people need to move out to, to the other areas. Because, uh, it, it, you know, the sewage load alone, it needs water. And Los Angeles is implementing water recovery. Where they, where they will take and uh, extract water from the sewage to make up the, the deficit, which means it, it's even more and more. And I forgot how many people are in the Los Angeles area, but it's at least 10 million, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's just ocean. And we have this, uh, we don't have the replenishing from from the, the mountains or, or from Colorado anymore. Uh, these issues are, are, are hitting elsewhere. The, the, the term is eutrophication, where the nutrient load coming through on the water exceeds the nutrient load that the uh, uh, ocean can handle. It overproduces algae that, that dies and consumes more oxygen and, and uh, has a very negative effect on the, uh, on the Gulf's ability to cycle materials um, for fish to live healthy and for other uh, carbon dioxide absorbing materials to even perform well. Uh, they just can't do it in a eutrophied zone. Wow. Well, it, it, it is a, we just need more people. You know, if the, the germ of, of automation. Can you say that again? There are a lot of people that complain about automation. 
but we need people addressing these issues. We need people that can do the, the, the thinking on the ground. And when, when we talk about what does automation do well, what do people do well? And we draw circles and we put things in it. This is what people do. Well, we have another circle and we put automation. What, what an area that's excluded by automation is automation hates change, variability and chaos. It likes things coming at it in an order. And people uh, actually thrive in chaos. You know, all of our best and best, best uh, that's probably a bad, bad word to choose. So much of our innovation comes during war times of chaos. It drives us. It's a pressure. It makes us do things. So uh, being on the spot where are the action's happening allows us to, to use our human minds, bodies, work effort to get things done that automation can. So automation can help us say this is where the, this is where the, the climate change is happening, such as what's happening with the satellites gaining this data and analyzing it for us and uh the humans are, are best in the hey what can we do what will we do what can we live with uh you know how, how can we make this uh in a, in a thriving enjoyable situation instead of misery and death well i appreciate you bringing this information to us again and it's also uh it's it's the kind of thing that I know people watching this might be like, oh man, this is pretty negative and it is pretty severe. What I would encourage people to do is this, use this information that the government gave you to uh, pressure local lawmakers to go into serious, if you live in the Western states, serious uh, water recycling, reclamation, all of this stuff and usage, like serious laws need to be put in place um, to help, to help thwart this because we're coming up at the sounds like on another massive drought and for three the last three years we've had decent rainfall it's gotten some of the levels back up and okay that's good but now what happens the thing i've always said like what happens if we have another two three four five years of drought again i mean we'll be right back to it by 2020 2022 um so uh, that's why I encourage everybody to, to get involved on a local level because the local water rights issues are going to affect you the most. Where you get your water, where you're living, and who controls that and monitors it and the legal bodies that maintain it, uh, pay for it, all that stuff is the most important part of it for wherever you are living to anybody watching this. So. Um, thanks again, Mitchell. I really appreciate it. And I uh, really appreciate you supporting the show. And again, folks, if you go to patreon.com, you get to do cool stuff like this. You can show us uh, the information that you're finding. And I, you know, use all of you guys as political vigilantes out there to bring me information uh, such as this. <laughs> so we all can see this and know exactly uh, what's going on. And I will put... Um, Let's bring in Victor the cat back in, your research assistant. Um, and uh, I will put the links to these websites that uh, you gave us, Mitchell, in the show notes below. So uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>